Um, first one up. So this will be a presentation on manure management in an urban setting. And it's really kind of the basic introduction into livestock in an urban setting. We will look at urban livestock and what livestock are allowed or what you need to do with that. The importance of manure management, the manure impacts and the regulations that impact even those little hobby farms and backyard poultry producers. And then we'll look at manure production and the handling and management issues that they sh you should be aware of. The first question you might have is, can I have livestock? This is something that varies tremendously all across the country, it will definitely vary by the county and the municipality. Um, one of the big questions is, are they considered livestock or pets? So whereas many towns may say you cannot have swine, you may be able to have a pot-bellied pig. And oftentimes as a pet, and oftentimes that difference is just based on where and how they are housed. Um, livestock may or may not be allowed in many municipalities. Livestock are not allowed. Um, other towns, they are, everyone can have them, or it may even vary by the property. So when we moved out to Utah many years ago, we were, and we're looking for a house, some houses had what were called animal rights. So if that residents had always had livestock, and over the years, you would you still had animal rights associated with that property, and you could have livestock. But if another, the neighbor, say next door, if they had let not had animals for two years or more, they lost those animal rights, and you could not reinstate them. So it can even vary by property within your town. Um, the next thing you really should look at is the numbers of livestock allowed. Again, this is very much based on the local regulations and there may be restrictions on which species are allowed. In Utah, we see many places where you can have bison even, but pigs may or may not be allowed. A lot of municipalities, at least out here, don't necessarily like having pigs super close to the neighbors. Uh, you should also look at the numbers that are allowed. Is it based on the number of head? Is it based on the size of the animal? And then if it's based on just the number of head, you need to look at if they have offspring, or do they count as another full animal the minute they're born, after three months, after a year, all of that you have to look at. They also may use um, animal units to determine the, the stocking rate. Typically in science, we use a definition of a thousand pounds of animal for the animal unit. Municipalities may or may not use that exact definition, so you need to check carefully as to what they are using for that animal unit. And you need to see if that's a total per residence or if it's a total per acre. So again, you have to go check those individual regulations. Now, you might be wondering why you should worry about manure management. And there's several reasons. Poor manure management can help reduce the livestock and performance and health. It, we can re result in increased transmission of parasites, illnesses and diseases if they're confined. That manure can release a lot of ammonia and that can also reduce the health of your, your animals. There can also be human health impacts. We have pathogens in manure. There can be E. coli, H1157, Listeria, Salmonella. If we aren't careful and getting it all over everything, it's possible for us to, for humans to become sick from that too. Um, other things that are big issues, flies, poor manure management oftentimes results in a lot of flies and also a lot of rodents. And then the critters that like rodents, so you might get skunks and things around. That's usually not appreciated by your neighbors at all. And you will end up getting a lot of complaints from neighbors in an urban setting. Um, keeping your neighbors happy and trying to minimize those complaints is probably one of the biggest things you should look at. The other thing to note is if you have any manure or contaminated water leaving your property, you can have environmental degradation. And that's those nutrients getting into water sources and leading to eutrophication. Um, we want to try to avoid that. We're trying to protect our environment. And if you have any discharges, and manure leaving your property, that can result in violations. There is no minimum size for an operation or minimum amount of manure that can 
contaminate water before EPA can find you. Now, if you have a super, you know, a teaspoon of manure getting into a little bit of water, they're probably not going to do anything, but EPA deliberately does not have a minimum size. Good manure management, on the other hand, can help keep our livestock pets healthy and our, it can help utilize those nutrients in a beneficial manner. That really should be our goal, is taking those nutrients that are in that manure, returning it to our gardens and pastures. It can improve our soil. And if you have good manure management and livestock that most people really like, you can have some really good neighbor relations and you can protect the environment. Now on the manure impact side, um, we talked about neighbor complaints. This is probably the biggest issue when you have livestock in an urban setting. Some neighbors aren't going to be real keen on having livestock next door. Um, some might be fine with it if they get to see the cute animals, but they are definitely going to be not happy if they can smell a lot of the manure, if there's a lot of insects or a lot of rodents. And so these are things especially you should be paying attention to, attention to. So how you handle that manure, how you store it, impacts a lot the amount of odor, the insects and the rodents that are, that are going to be around. The other thing to keep in mind is the aesthetics. Your neighbor does not wanna sit in their backyard trying to enjoy the evening with a drink or a glass of lemonade, only to be staring at your manure pile right across their fence that's probably not going to make them happy at all. So think about it from their standpoint. Or if you have an acreage and you have acreage out front, even if you're putting it away from the house, but if you put that manure pile up along the road, people don't really wanna go drive by manure piles either. So think about that and what it looks like for, for your neighbors and the community. And then things to think about as you have those manure piles, especially out west, we tend to have everything dry out, especially right now with all of our super drought conditions. But those manure piles oftentimes just desiccate. And then as we get wind, that wind is blowing little bits of manure and dust. And oftentimes our manure piles don't really grow a lot. They kind of shrink as it blows away. That's something we really should be watching. A, that manure can get into water sources and create problems but it also creates problems for your neighbors and it's unsightly and you are just essentially discharging manure into other areas and that's that's a big no-no. In the wetter areas especially or even in our dry areas when we do get some rainfall you do need to watch for any runoff that's coming off of those manure piles and making sure that that's not leaving your property that you're containing it. As we have manure that especially that leaves our property, one of the biggest issues that we should look watch for is eutrophication. The manure has nutrients in it that can be either beneficial or neg detrimental. When we get nutrients into our waterways, it's too many nutrients, it creates algae blooms. And that algae bloom then is the algae decomposes and stuff, the bacteria de decomposing it, suck up all of the oxygen out of the water and we can get fish kills. It can create some really unsightly messes some really messy, smelly messes with rotten, with dead fish. And one thing to note is that those nutrients don't have to be just from manure. It can be from your fertilizer that you put on your yard and aren't applying appropriately or failing septic systems. And so it's not just manure management that can create eutrophication. Just on a side note that it's not just manure, um, PBS NewsHour recently had a broadcast on the manatees in Florida at the Indian River Lagoon. And you can see here, they had about 1,100 die last year. They're having a huge problem. The manatees are dying in droves due to starvation because of the nutrients that are getting into the water. The nutrients are creating um, algae growth, brown tides, which in turn blocks the sunlight that lets the seaweed that the manatees eat um, choke that. That seaweed is no longer getting the sunlight it needs to grow, so it's choking out and dying. The manatees aren't getting enough food and they're starving. And that, as you can see, it's an area that really probably doesn't have any livestock. That Those nutrients, they attribute it to being from failing septic systems and fertilizers off of the lawns and gardens. So 
The other thing to keep in mind is that there are regulations that are attributable to, you know, that everyone has to abide by, and even if you only have a few little poultry in your backyard. And the big one is that you, there's to be no discharge of manure into a federal water or a water of the state. In Utah, we define that as any water that leaves our property, but th there's no minimum amount. So we are not to have discharges of manure into waters. And there is a grazing exemption. So if you are lucky enough to have an acreage and you have some pasture, you can have direct access of the livestock to a, water, a stream or river if you have adequate vegetation. If you do not have adequate vegetation, livestock are not to have direct access to the water. And so oftentimes, especially like cattle, if they're coming up out of a, a stream or river and climbing up, the defecate as they're leaving that water source, you end up with a manure and you're getting into that water. So if you can or are willing to fence them out of that water source, that's really the very best. But if you have adequate vegetation, in Utah, we define that as about four inches of desirable vegetation across the pasture, not just in one spot, then those livestock can have direct access to the water. If you do not have adequate vegetation, like this picture, that horse should not have direct access to that water. You should have, a, have that waterway fenced off. You should have a water trough or a nose pump or some other way for that animal to get water. Now you might be saying, but I only have three little goats. How much of a problem can that possibly be? Now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not big enough to create any problem. Well, let's just take a quick look at some common examples that we might see. Somebody that has two horses, at least in Utah, we have lots and lots of places that have horses. Um, someone that has just 12 chickens in their backyard. And let's just look then also at what we get with two dogs. Now here is a table that gives us some averages from manure weight to manure volume produced by animal species. Um, please note that these are just averages. The numbers will vary tremendously based on the actual breed of animal and the age of animal, the, definitely the diet that they're eating, any bedding and things that you're using. But this will give us a good starting point as to where, how much manure we can expect to be getting. So if we have two horses, and I'm not gonna go through the calculations, but you're going to get almost 20 tons of manure in a year from those two horses. And with bedding, that basically doubles the volume. So total with the bedding, we can expect to get about 24 tons of waste per year and more than 2,100 cubic feet of waste. So as, if you have those two horses, you need to think about what you are going to do with all of that manure and bedding. Where are you going to store it? How are you going to store it? How are you going to not make it be an unsightly mess and a problem for you and your neighbors? If you have 12 chickens, they're small. We're gonna say they're about four pounds each. Um, you're going to get about a total of about a thousand pounds and about 24 cubic feet of waste and bedding. In many cases for like 12 chickens like that, oftentimes that waste is just dumped into a garbage can. Um, that is an environmentally safe way to get dispose of it. It's really missing one key thing. If we can utilize those nutrients beneficially, it's really much better them filling up our landfill. And poultry litter can ha has some really great nutrients. So if there's a way to use that beneficially, that's the better option. And let's just take a look at dogs. If we have two dogs that are about 66 pounds each, and so they're producing about 1.76 pounds of urine a day and 0.88 pounds of feces per day. Now, as a dog owner, you're probably going out there and picking it up. The, the feces, the urine is just get being deposited on a lawn spot, probably in most cases, possibly a pee pad. But we oftentimes don't really think about how much manure is being produced by some of our pets. So it's one thing to keep in mind that the, they are also producing nutrients and we should be just paying attention to how those nutrients are being utilized or where they're going. And one note of caution, 
anytime anyone is dealing with manure, you should always wash your hands afterwards. It's just a good safety precaution. So now let's look at the manure production and handling. We're going to see where it's produced, how we might handle it, the storage options, and then we'll look at the application and, and use. The pasture, if you have an acreage, it's by far probably the easiest. It's the least amount of effort. You aren't having to collect that urine and feces. You aren't having to store it the same way. I mean, those nutrients are recycled directly onto that pasture. One thing to note, only about 10% of that pasture is going to get a urine or fecal spot in any given year. You may want to occasionally drag that pasture to break up those, those cow pies or break up the manure. Um, the other thing, if you have a pasture, if you can implement rotational grazing, it will help you have more forage production, have a better pasture setting, provide more feed for your, your animals and help utilize those, more of those nutrients. The big issue here really is if you have any streams or water sources in that pasture or next to that pasture and making sure either that the livestock are fenced out of it and you, utilizing like a nose pump or a separate water trough or if you really want them to have direct access to that water source, they oftentimes have, recommend having essentially little um, rocked or graveled entry points and limiting their, their point of access onto that, into that water source. If they can only go down and then have to back out, you can minimize a lot of the, the fecal deposition into that water. If you have smaller animals like fur, like rabbits or fur animals or some little poultry, poultries, um, poultry birds, the manure, you may have them in a cage outside. That manure typically drops through that cage down to the ground. Typically that manure is just collected and removed. In many cases it's put into a trash can. Again, environmentally safe that way. Um, especially rabbit poo is actually almost, you know, a supreme, fertilizer source for many people. So there may be ways to utilize that manure beneficially. The big issue here is really just to pay attention to what's happening to that manure under the cages. Are you having water get run into it and then run off? The key is we generally try to always make sure we don't have water running into any manure. And we absolutely need to make sure that we have no water running off and running away from our manure piles. If you have a bedded stall or barn, such as for horses and cattle, um, we oftentimes have manure and soil bedding that we are removing oftentimes daily with manual cleaning. That bedding and manure gets typically gets stockpiled. If a good approach, if you can, is to compost it, it will help reduce the volume and reduce the flies and the, that you're going that are going to be generated off of that and the odors. The big issue here really is making sure you have adequate storage for that and then to make sure that you don't have any run on or run off from that manure stockpile and also to make sure especially in those drier climates that you aren't getting dust and manure blowing off of that pile. And if we have corrals or dry lots pens typically our goal is to keep it clean and dry we scrape it as we need to that manure is piled again we want to watch for any runoff or dust from the pen or the manure stockpile. One thing to note, if you have a corral or a pen, this is something, and you're especially out in the county a little bit and you have your own water well, don't do this. This is a water well, the water well for the house. Do not have your livestock and their corral right surrounding your, your well. Any corrals or pens should be at least 100 feet from your well. Otherwise, you're just asking to have those nutrients seep through that soil and get into your groundwater and contaminate your water supply. So we look at manure storage areas for the manure stockpiles. Ideal is if we can have a pad underneath, a concrete pad, especially with a couple little walls, it really helps contain that and helps you with the loading and stuff. If you don't have a pad, it's fine to put it on the ground. Again, make sure there's no run on or run off. Um, you are supposed to move that pile every year, change the location, and you should then be planting vegetation at that spot for at least three years. 
And again, there should be no run on or run off into those manure piles. Especially as you go further east, you may see more storage bins. Um, and typically the further east you go, the more you will see that will be covered. And that's because of the rainfall. Manure and rain are not always great combinations. And so oftentimes a covered storage bin, typically on a pad works really well, especially in those wetter environments. The walls can help contain the manure, prevent runoff, a roof especially helps prevent you from getting too much water into that manure and creating this soppy mess. Um, the other is to have manure compost areas, and especially for the smaller settings, this is a really great option. You can have real small volumes with rings, heaps, bins, or barrels. If you want to be composting it, you really need a minimum of one cubic yard to have it be big enough to maintain the heat to do the act of composting. The goal is we need to be getting that compost. It needs to have enough water and enough oxygen. Those bacteria heat up. They then help break stuff down, but they also kill weed seeds, kill pathogens. So we want that active composting process. If you have more manure, you can do larger volumes. You can do piles, you can do windrows. Windrows work pretty well, even with like a little bucket loader on a tractor. And again, any of these, we should have no run on and no run off. We're trying to contain that manure and deal it with the minimal amount of volume that we have to. And if you're composting, you will want to be monitoring the moisture and the temperature. Some other manure storage considerations, we do want to pay attention to the distance from our streams, ponds, and wells. It will vary by the state and the municipality. A minimum guideline is 100 feet. Some states and areas will have larger distances, but you should be at least 100 feet from any stream, pond, or well. Um, from your distance from neighbors, again, you have to look at your local ordinances, but a minimum would be 200 feet from another residence and 50 feet from the property line. And a couple other things to think about, look at your, the slope of your ground. Putting a manure pile on a steep hill is not really a great idea because anytime you get any moisture, you're going to have runoff wanting to, to leave that manure pile. Um, some ways to help maintain and prevent any run on and run off is through berms and buffer strips. And berms are a really inexpensive way to help con contain that runoff. Other things to think about, though, is think about the prevailing wind direction. If your wind typically comes from the west, try and site your manure pile so that it's not directly blowing all of the odor and any dust directly onto your neighbors. That's, that's a surefire way to make them really unhappy. And so think about that prevailing wind direction and try and site any manure pile where it impacts your neighbors as little as possible. The other thing to think about is to think about the aesthetics. A manure pile piled out in the front, if you have a pasture and you even if you have acreage in front of your house, but you're piling your manure up along the road, that makes a lot of people unhappy. Typically, if your neighbor can see the manure pile, they are going to be certain they can smell it. They will be certain that every fly they ever see is directly from that manure pile. If you can help hide it, it goes a long way. So if you can put it behind trees or behind fences, that will help alleviate some of that, will help prevent some of the dust issues. It will also help force some of the odors to move up instead of so laterally. And our manure application use and disposal. Ultimately, the thing to remember is that manure is really a resource. We oftentimes treat it as a waste and we joke about it being as a waste, but it's really a resource. And so the goal is should be to use, utilize those nutrients in a beneficial manner. Manure builds our soil and promotes our plant growth. It has a lot of really important nutrients. It has some of our macronutrients, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And if you've been pricing fertilizer at all, Right now, fertilizer expenses are skyrocketing. There is no reason not to be accounting for those nutrients in your manure and utilizing them. The other thing is that our manure actually has a lot more than that. It has the macronutrients, it has some micronutrients, but it also improves our soil health. And one of the biggest things it does is it adds organic matter. 
especially out west here where a lot of our soils are not very well developed. They don't have a lot of organic matter. Every little bit of organic matter that we can add to that soil is really beneficial. That organic matter helps give our soil more um, cation exchange capacity sites, more binding sites. So it really makes it, changes it from being like a sponge that doesn't hold very much liquid to a sponge that will hold a lot of liquid. And that right, we makes our soil so that it can hold more nutrients and more liquid, which is then readily available for our plants, which lets our plants be much more resilient, especially in the West as we're facing a lot of drought conditions. The other thing to think about is the value of the, the nutrients in that manure. So remember our example of the two horses, one ton of manure for horses on average is going to have about 12.1 pounds of nitrogen per ton. Remember our two horses produced about 20 tons of manure per year. That's about 242 pounds of nitrogen per year that you are, that's in that manure that you are trying to figure out what to do with. If you can utilize that manure in a beneficial manner and recycle and reuse those nutrients, that is a great process. To do that, we need to test both our soil and our manure. We should be applying nutrients and manure only according to the soil needs and what crop we're going to be growing. As we apply that manure, we should be incorporating it right after application, if at all possible. And please note that winter application may be limited. Um, we also sh should be testing that manure each, each year, and that's because the manure will vary based on the age of the animals, the animals that you have, and you need to know how many nutrients are truly in that manure, not just the average. And you need to know what your soil actually needs. Again, as you apply manure, please make sure that you are not applying manure within 100 feet of a well or any water sources. We need to have some buffer zones in there. And if you don't want all of it or you have way more than you can utilize, there are other ways to, for that, to utilize that manure beneficially. If you have a lot of horses and more volume, you may have farmers that would be more than happy to come get that manure. If you don't, if you're in a more urban setting, oftentimes other gardeners would love to get some, especially if you compost it. If you compost it, you will have people coming, you know, beating down your door for, to be able to get some of that compost. Um, comp composting not only reduces the volume and the odor, but it helps kill those weed seeds and the pathogens. And so it really makes, it's an easy amendment to, for people to use and to transport. And so if at all possible, you should be trying to utilize that manure in a beneficial manner. So in summary, whether you have a little bit of manure or a lot, it's really important that our manure is managed correctly. We want to minimize any health impacts, both to livestock and humans. We want to minimize any environmental impacts and we want to be aware of the regulations. We should not be having any manure get into a water source. And our goal is really should be to utilize those nutrients in a beneficial manner. Um, there are neighbors, many, many cases, neighbors that would love to have some of that manure or especially compost. But if we can utilize those nutrients beneficially, that's a great attribute. And probably the most important thing for you in an urban setting is to be considerate of your neighbors. They, they want to enjoy their yard and their home just like you want to enjoy yours. And most of them do not want to smell odors from your manure. They don't want to be bothered with a lot of flies from your manure and they don't want to necessarily see it. They may love to see your critters, but they don't really want to see those manure piles. So be considerate of your neighbors. It makes it easier for everyone and will make your life much more pleasant too.